At the dawn of the 71 season, it was obvious that Denver had assembled the most talented group in its history. Go, go! Game number one against Miami strengthened that concept. Behind an offensive line that would afford the best protection in Denver history, quarterback Don Horn thrilled the first of seven straight standing room crowds at Mile High Stadium by moving the team confidently and consistently. Bobby Anderson, number 11, and first-year Bronco Jack Gerke, number 40, gave Denver's offense some versatility that was lacking in recent years. The Broncos took the lead on snub-toed Jim Turner's field goal. The offense was moving, and Floyd Little made a great opening bid on his first 1,000-yard season. Even so, Jim Turner barely missed two others, and the Broncos could only score one touchdown. Horn threw perfectly to rookie Dwight Harrison near the goal line, and Denver led 10-3. Although the Dolphins tied the game on a late pass to Paul Warfield, the 10-10 tie was a good beginning against a title contending team. Denverites have been waiting for a winner for a long time. They have the defense to win. What they need is more scoring. Coach Lou Saban even brought some new glasses this year, hopefully for more frequent looks at the scoreboard. But as Miami's Dolphins found out, the fate in Denver is still hard-hitting defense. As Larry Zonka, number 39, earned every one of 63 yards rushing. Following a first quarter Miami field goal, Denver tied the score after Bobby Anderson completed a 48-yard option pass to Jack Gerke, number 40, a first-year starter from Utah. With the score tied at 3-all, the game settled into a curious pattern. Both Zonka and Denver's Floyd Little, number 44, hammered away with effect between the 20-yard lines. Now, one might think the 20-yard line is close enough for a field goal attempt, and it is. And they tried and tried, and missed and missed. The two teams missed a total of five, and it wasn't until the last moments of the third quarter that Denver broke the deadlock. As you might expect, a 31-yard pass from Don Horn to rookie Dwight Harrison, number 82. It looked like the 10-3 lead was going to hold up, which it did until late in the game when Denver suffered a 14-yard punt deep in their own territory. After that, all it took was one flick of Bob Greasy's wrist, one flick of Paul Warfield's hip, and the surprisingly even contest turned out to be just that, 10-10. One of the Broncos' perennial weaknesses has been the lack of consistently effective quarterbacking. At the beginning of the season, Don Horn looked as if he would be the provider. In game two against the Packers, Don was carrying over his success against Miami. Melding the bursts of Floyd Little with accurate passes, the Broncos finessed their way to the Packers' six-yard line. But suddenly, Denver's delicate confidence collapsed like a house of cards. Interceptions and other mistakes turned the game's momentum permanently into the hands of the Packers, and the Broncos were trumped. 34 to 13. Ironically, this loss marked the beginning of what often would curse the Broncos, the inability to score a touchdown from close range. Life came late in the fourth quarter when linebacker Fred Forsberg picked off a Green Bay pass. The interception led to the only Denver touchdown, a six-yard pass from reserve Steve Ramsey, number 10, to number 80, Jerry Simmons. The rebuilding Packers 34, Denver 13. During the 11 years he's coached the Chiefs, Hank Stram has lost to the Denver Broncos exactly twice in 22 outings. Lou Saban has been the party of the second part for seven of those 20 losses, and he's getting tired of it. 
Both Denver and Kansas City are very strong defensive teams. The Chiefs could manage but a total of 160 yards against Saban's Rocky Mountains in cleats. And the Denver pass rush is legendary. Against the Raiders, a Titan Bronco defense haltered the Raiders' attack. And again, Horn had the offense moving. For lack of one more block, Floyd was stopped at the nine, and Denver settled for a field goal. Bobby Anderson reached the 20, and again, three points was the result. The offense was playing its heart up, but instead of leading by 21 or even 17 points, the Broncos winded themselves, building only a 9-3 lead. And Oakland came back 27-16. The Oakland Raiders visited Denver, and all they wanted to do was cut the Broncos down to size. And they succeeded. Denver's problem wasn't that they lacked a big play. Floyd Little went 74 yards on this one, and it led to a field goal. Number 54, Chip Myrtle intercepted on this one, and it led to a field goal. Don Horn hit number 11, Bobby Anderson on this play, and it also led to a field goal. And by now you've guessed that the Broncos' problem was that they couldn't score a touchdown. Did Denver get the idea as Steve Ramsey hit Dickey Post for a touchdown? But by then, the Broncos had been whittled down to size, 27-16. It wasn't until week number five against the Chargers that Denver won its first game. Jack Gerke recovered a fumble at the three-yard line, and Bobby Anderson plunged in for a lead Denver never relinquished. Confidence is one of the great intangibles of pro football, and with Jim Turner's 49-yard line drive scoring for them again, Denver began to generate an aura of what a good football team is. After five games in 1970, the Broncos were in first place. And although playing just as well in 1971, they were tied for last. This was another of the ironies of the 1971 season. In Denver, the battle between the Broncos and San Diego Chargers was a must game for Denver coach Lou Saban. Saban had been the subject of much criticism, but the winless Broncos' misfortunes have often been the result of injuries and bad breaks. Against the Chargers, Denver got a few breaks for a change. Fumble recovery by number 40, Jack Gerke, set up the first Denver score. A one-yard run by Bobby Anderson, number 11. Denver quarterback Don Horn, number 13, who had been plagued by interceptions, was right on target in the first half. He connected often with his running backs, number 11, Anderson, and number 44, Floyd Little. Horn set up the second Bronco score when he speared Floyd a little over the middle for a 25-yard gain. While the Chargers managed only two field goals, the Broncos dominated the first half on the strength of power running by Floyd Little, number 44. San Diego's John Hadle, number 21, 
has also been victimized by interceptions this year. This theft by linebacker Chip Myrtle, number 54, was one of several key defensive plays that shut off Charger drives. After Myrtle's interception, hard-running Bobby Anderson, number 11, set up one of two Jim Turner field goals that gave Denver a 20-6 halftime lead. In the second half, the Chargers finally got rolling on a 54-yard end-around run by rookie Billy Parks, number 32. Parks run set up a touchdown pass to number 27, Gary Garrison. The Chargers also added a last minute field goal, but the Broncos managed to hang on for a slim 20 to 16 victory. Manifesting all their diversity and confidence, the Denver offense set two club records. Don Horn threw sparingly while Floyd Little, Bobby Anderson, and tight end Billy Masters contributed to a record 280 yards rushing. In addition, the pass protection was perfect as Denver controlled the ball for the opening 10 minutes in driving 92 yards to a touchdown. Defensively, the Broncos were magnificent, handing Cleveland its first shutout in 20 years. The defenders set three team records while holding the Browns to 60 yards in total offense. They forced four turnovers and completely dominated Cleveland throughout the game. Floyd Little himself outgained Cleveland's vaunted rushing offense 113 yards to 24. And Denver was on its way to a smashing 27 to nothing victory. One great victory does not equal a successful season, but it is an indication of capability. In his five seasons as head coach, Lou Saban brought the Broncos up from the doormat of defeat to the threshold of consistent victory. The process is unfinished, although infinitely more complete than five years ago. This was the first meeting between the Browns and Broncos in Cleveland. Playing for a team like Denver presents certain psychological confrontations for the players as week after week they play well enough to win, but do not. Denver is talented, and they know it. But even as the team warms up, the gum chewing becomes a little more intense, and the players hope that finally this will be the week they put it all together. Against Cleveland, a championship team, Denver played about as perfect a game as they ever had. Denver took the opening kickoff and rolled right through the Browns downfield and scored. It wasn't fancy or really thrilling, but that Floyd Little, number 44, and Bobby Anderson, number 11, were able to hammer out yardage play after play was certainly good for the team's head. Don Horn's pass to Billy Masters made it 7-0. Although favorites are often scored upon first only to come back and crush upset attempts, Denver kept pouring it on.
Cleveland quarterback Bill Nelson was hounded, searched out, and destroyed by a clawing Denver defense that finally forced him to compound a mistake into a failure by recovering his second fumble on the same play. What was impressive about Denver were the 280 yards in rushing. Denver likes to run, but all too often they fail to score. Floyd Little had over 100 yards and Bobby Anderson 72. Six on his touchdown run and for a change, Denver could look across the football field and see the other guy chewing his gum in a way the Broncos were all too accustomed. If the offense was impressive, the defense was fanatic. Cleveland has scored in every game it has played since 1950 until last Sunday. Number 52, Fred Forsberg, chugged his way into the end zone with a Bill Nelson pass, making the score 24-0 at the half. The handwriting was pretty well on the wall. For the Browns, it was an embarrassing defeat, but they'll get over it. For the Broncos, who two weeks ago were winless, it marked their second straight win and another hopeful step in their painfully slow development. Denver, 27. Cleveland, nothing. Perhaps the Broncos will never get over it. Pointed out by the game in Philadelphia. Again, the Broncos were dominating the game. Floyd ran for 123 yards. The Eagle quarterbacks were being embarrassed, and Denver was well on its way to another win. these fine performances were spoiled when a pair of lapses allowed the Eagles two cheap touchdowns. When the Broncos were in position to win the game late in the fourth quarter, they didn't. Not only was the one-point loss heartbreaking, but Rich Jackson was lost for the remaining seven games. The Eagles play football in South Philadelphia, where win or lose, the fans are always in a hurry to reveal that everyone speaks the same language. Well, almost everyone. While some Eagle fans got their letters crossed up, Denver's Lou Saban had his signals crossed because his Broncos were supposed to beat the Eagles and they did not. Everyone expected Denver's premier running back, Floyd Little, to have a good day, and he did, gaining over 120 yards, but Denver could manage only one touchdown. Also expected was a lot of contact from Denver's defensive front four, and all you have to do is ask Eagles quarterback Rick Arrington about them. But even though the Eagles' offense was virtually non-existent, they didn't need much because their specialty teams made it easy. Leading 3 to nothing in the second quarter, Tom McNeil punted to Denver's Billy Thompson, number 36. Thompson was separated from the ball and reality by Ike Kelly, number 51. Steve Zabel recovered, and the Eagles scored on a Rick Arrington pass to Ben Hawkins. Eagle linebacker Billy Hobbs, number 56, plays on the Eagles specialty team because he's very fast and very tough. With the Eagles leading 10-7, he entered the game with a punt coverage team. Denver's Billy Van Heusen found out how fast when Hobbs blocked his second quarter punt and scored the Eagles' second touchdown, as reported on the spot by defensive end Richard Harris, number 84. If Hobbs was the hero of the first half, then it was only fair that his roommate be the hero of the second. Inching closer on a pair of third quarter field goals and gaining momentum in the fourth, 
Denver's Don Horn tried to cross up the Eagles on some deep pass routes. Unfortunately for him, safety Bill Bradley, number 28, was running the best routes as twice in the fourth quarter, he saved the Eagles' good fortune. Throughout the Eagles' tempestuous season, Bradley has been the most consistent performer. But somehow people see, but cannot recognize, a 5'11 Dynamo from Palestine, Texas. And everybody knows that a kid from Texas knows the difference between a football and a hot potato. Denver had another chance late in the game, but Bradley's green wave countered with some head-ripping defense of their own. And it was all over for Denver. Although the Eagles didn't do much, they had Hobbs and Bradley on their side, and that was what they needed. Eagles 17, Broncos 16. After the loss to the Eagles, there were few in Denver who would have thought the Broncos had much of a chance against Detroit. But with number 79, Carter Campbell, filling in for Rich Jackson, the defense didn't miss a beat. The talented Lions were shut out during the first half, while the Broncos methodically ground their way to a 10 to nothing lead. It was quite a half for the Broncos, and the disbelieving Denverites saw that their team could rebound from bitter disappointment. As complete as the Broncos' performance was in the first half of this game, 1971 was still the year of irony. Leading 10 to nothing with seconds remaining in the half, Jerry Simmons caught a pass that would have ballooned the total to 17. But a penalty called after the touchdown nullified the play and Detroit exploited its reprieve. In the second half, Detroit staged a rally that saw them take the lead 17 to 13. But Denver scored again on a run by Bobby Anderson with 10 minutes left in the game. When Detroit regained the lead with two minutes left, all seemed lost, but it was a poised Bronco offense that saved the clock while covering 60 yards. When Dwight Harrison stepped out of bounds at the Detroit 23 with still over a minute left, it seemed like a new beginning. Instead, a fumbled snap turned it into an all-too-familiar ending. But in spite of all the frustration and defeat, the beginning of 1972 includes the memory of one perfect performance. In Mile High Stadium, the maturing Denver Broncos met the very grown-up Detroit Lions. But for a while, it was the Lions who were short on poise. This Bill Thompson interception of a Greg Landry pass was only one of a number of mistakes that throttled the Lions in the early going. A determined Denver defense and an Alti Taylor fumble combined to shut out the Lions in the first half.
Meanwhile, the Broncos were moving well behind their good backs, number 44, Floyd Little, and number 11, Bobby Anderson. Anderson set up the Broncos' first score with a 36-yard burst. And then he finished what he started by taking a flare from Don Horn for 12 yards and a 10-0 lead over the Detroit Lions. might have put the game out of reach if this bomb from Horn to Jerry Simmons had not been disqualified by a holding penalty. Detroit took over in the third period. Number 42, Algie Taylor, outraced everybody and the Lions were on the board. Then Landry hit for a 76-yard score as Earl McCullough beat Bill Thompson and tantalized him with his fleet feet all the way home. A flare pass to Steve Owen set up a field goal, and Detroit had 17 points in the third period. Denver regained the lead briefly on a five-yard run by Bobby Anderson. But Landry and Charlie Sanders took the lead and the game back as Detroit won a tough one from Denver, 24-20. to Denver can still play defense, it served as a perfect complement for a Virgil Carter trademark, the spectacular. Broncos did rally. A pass from reserve quarterback Steve Ramsey to Dwight Harrison narrowed the score to 17-10, and momentum was clearly shifting. The Denver Broncos had a new coach, Jerry Smith, a new quarterback, Steve Ramsey, and a new way to beat the Kansas City Blitz. Number 80, Jerry Simmons, accounted for 153 yards receiving on six catches. But he could only set up one field goal for the offense-starved Broncos, whose only other score came on a bolt up the middle by Floyd Little. At Three Rivers Stadium this year, the Steelers were undefeated. But against Denver, the Steelers were unable to reach win number six. The fourth quarter safety was but one of the Steelers' errors. Although some worked out to their advantage, the Bronco defense, though ravaged by injury, was just too much for both Terry Bradshaw, number 12, and Terry Hanratty, number five. With all pro Rich Jackson out for the season, Paul Smith, number 70, has taken over as quarterback tormentor number one. The play of Smith and his line mates held the Steelers to one touchdown. Following a fumble recovery, a pass from Terry Hanratty to Preston Pearson put the Steelers on the board. But while the Steelers were having their moments, Denver's Floyd Little was having his day. And again, accounting for well over 100 yards in total offense, Floyd looked as good as he has all season. And that's not bad, considering he's among the top rushers in the AFC. But sometimes it's what you don't see that's important. 
When coach Lou Saban stepped aside two weeks ago, Floyd was visibly shaken by Denver's season-long season of misfortunes. He was also pondering retiring. On Sunday, however, it was the Steelers who were visibly shaken. Floyd scored twice, leaving stunned defenders in his wake. And Denver woke up to Club Pittsburgh 22 to 10. Floyd's splendid performance made a success of quarterback Steve Ramsey's second start as a professional. Denver parlayed their strengths into victory. The line blocked. Floyd ran. The opposing quarterback was dropped and the ball turned over three times. The difference in winning this game 22 to 10 was that the Broncos scored when they had to. The irony in winning this game is that many felt the Broncos could have beaten almost anybody 22 to 10. The Chicago Bears blasted into Mile High Stadium for a shootout with the Denver Broncos. And the game was not only out of sight, but out of hand as well. No team seemed able to convert the multitude of opportunities presented them. Floyd Little put Denver in great scoring position the very first quarter. But whenever Denver knocked on the door, too often there was nobody home. Or somebody home that Denver didn't want to see as Charlie Ford intercepted two passes. One bizarre second quarter sequence told the story of the game. Charlie Ford intercepted his second pass. From the Denver 48, a Bobby Douglas pass was then intercepted by Charlie Greer, number 20. Not to appear overconfident, quarterback Steve Ramsey fumbled and Tony McGee recovered. But even after three successive turnovers, fate was still snickering. Bobby Douglas's touchdown run was called back for holding. And on the next play, linebacker Olin Underwood, number 50, intercepted to end the threat. For the rest of the game, Douglas spent most of his time perusing the Colorado sky as Denver trapped him nine times. The game's big play looked like pure pandemonium. What it was, however, was a personal foul against Chicago that set up snub toe Jim Turner's second field goal. Denver had the last laugh, Denver six, Chicago three. Against the Bears, the offense again had difficulty scoring. Fortunately, the front line defenders trapped Bobby Douglas a season high nine times. Denver won by holding Chicago to minus seven yards passing. This game also displayed another step forward by the defense in 1971. They forced more turnovers than ever before. Denver linebackers intercepted eight passes, an improvement of eight over 1970. And the Chargers played Denver for last. 
The Broncos looked like good bets in this year's basement bowl as number 44, Floyd Little, pushed his yardage over the 1,000 mark. In Oakland, the Denver Broncos wondered what they could do to make 1971 something other than just another losing season. They tried some bone-jarring defense, and it worked. They tried a fake field goal, and in its own way, that worked. But when they needed the big break, the Broncos saw the kind of thing that has become all too familiar, the fumble that gets away. Even a fake punt from the end zone backfired, and Oakland beat Denver again. Little, their all-pro halfback, shot his season total up to 1,133 yards, a career high for him, and the best total in pro football in 1971. But as happens all too often for Floyd and his teammates, the best never counts. Floyd took a second quarter handoff that apparently had narrowed the score to 14-10. But it was ruled that Floyd stepped out of bounds on the 20. Steve Ramsey's pass to Clem Turner came with only seconds left as the Raiders, who had their own frustrations to take out, beat Denver 21-13. As interim coach, Jerry Smith made a valuable contribution, but now there is a new leader in the Broncos' midst. With John Ralston from Stanford, the Broncos hope to blend his winning tradition with the steps they've already taken. And in going back to the beginning, the end doesn't seem so far away.